Hey everybody, it's Skalmladex, and welcome back to some more Magic Arena, and today the Chromatic Cube has returned to Arena. For those who don't know, a cube draft is where instead of drafting out of 15 card booster packs of a specific set, we're going to be drafting out of a curated list of cards from all different sets on Arena. The Chromatic Cube is focused on a bunch of multicolored cards and mana fixing, a lot of the most powerful, splashy, high mana cost, and multicolored sort of effects on Arena. As such, the cube is filled with tons of rares and mythics, so we will not be keeping any of the cards that we draft. This is a format that is just for the fun of the event as well as the prizes on the tracker. Without further ado, let's go ahead and bust open these packs and see what we get to play with today. Alright, here we are for our pack one pick one in the return to the chromatic cube. We have tons of incredibly powerful options as always, and you can't go super wrong with anything in cube draft. You can kind of just draft whatever archetype you enjoy the most. We have several super powerful options. I think the strongest ones here are cards like Terror of the Peaks, 5 mana 5 for Flyer. As you play other creatures, those get to start shooting any target when they hit the board. So you can turn all of your other creatures into removal spells or damage directly to your opponent's face. Gyruda Doom of Depths is flexible and super powerful because it can go into any blue or black deck. It can be in the companion slot to make it really consistent, and it's just going to be a very good reanimator card no matter what. Noxious Gear Hulk is a great card, gaining you a ton of life and destroying the biggest creature on board when it hits the board. And... Sky Sovereign Console Flagship, similar to Noxious Gear Hulk, where it hits the board, blows something up. And this one can even potentially repeatedly kill things if there's enough cards with three or less toughness on board. So, like all of these, I like these big standalone threats that are all like two for ones or better, like creature plus removal spell, creature plus removal spell, vehicle plus removal spell, creature plus reanimator. And I think I'm going to go with Gyruda here. It's. A really interesting card because it's both super flexible and super narrow depending on how I want to build around it. We could restrict ourselves to taking only even mana costs so that we always have this in hand and we have a very clear, easy way to draft from now on. Or we could take it and just be super flexible with it and be like, well, if we're playing blue or black in any amount, we can play this pretty easily off the hybrid mana cost in the main deck. So I think Gyruda seems like a pretty sweet way to start. For pack 1, pick 2, tons of powerful cards again. If I want to take an even mana value card to try to get Gyruda in the companion slot, we could take Jonathan Harker here, which can set up your draws with some draw and discard, basically, but then later in the game start casting a bunch of stuff for free, which is pretty strong. There's Gaunty, which is always fun, stealing your opponent's cards and playing them against them. And that is an even mana value, so it would fit in with a Gyruda in the companion slot as well. We could take a Triome here. It's a blue-black dual land, plus it could get green mana if we need that. Could take Ashiok even. And again, we're not married to blue-black specifically, so we could take any card in the pack if I want to take Archangel or something, but I think I'm going to go Ashiok. I think this is a very powerful Planeswalker. Mind. Surrender them to me. Wow, Ashiok has a lot to say. Uh, but yeah, five mana Planeswalker spits out a creature every turn to block with mills your opponent really quickly two cards every time that the creature attacks or blocks seems like a really strong card it is an odd mana cost so not trying to play Gyruda in the companion slot in a deck using ashiok for pack one pick three i'm not in love with any of these cards i like ophiomancer a decent amount if you're a sacrifice deck you get a snake every single turn to sacrifice Plus, if you're just defensive in general, you're always going to have a 1-1 death touch. So Ophiomancer's fine um, for blue-black with Ashiok and Gyruda. Considers a solid, cheap little card draw spell, sets up your draws, gets what you need. Chart, of course, also a decent, cheap card draw spell, but that is sorcery speed. Try to splash in Casualties of War as a massive removal spell. I don't think we're aggressive enough for Professional Facebreaker in any blue-black deck. I'll just go for Consider and take a card that makes your deck more consistent no matter what. Now we can take the Three Weird Sisters here. Really powerful, really flexible card. Gives you card draw or makes each player sack a creature and then becomes just a gigantic version of a vampire Nighthawk. A big flying, death-touching lifelinker. 
So that card's pretty pretty sweet. I don't know any of the alchemy cards particularly well, so I'm probably going to pass up on a lot of these, but let's see what this one is. 3 mana, 3-3. Three, three. Choose an instant or sorcery in your hand. Give it casualty 2. So make it so the next instant or sorcery that you want to cast can be copied by sacrificing a creature with power 2 or more. That includes the spell drain assassin. So you could play this and then your next instant or sorcery sacrifice the assassin to double it. That's interesting. It doesn't seem super worth the 3 color restrictive mana cost on it. Could go control and take the board wipe, but I'm pretty happy to take the three weird sisters, the Henrika Dumnothy here. I have always been a fan of that card in my black decks of any variety. For pack one, pick five, we can take a Shipwreck Marsh for a very good blue-black dual land. We could also take Vraska Betrayal's Sting, a very big, very powerful Planeswalker. Multiple removal spells on a stick with the minus two ability. Or some card draw with the zero. The zero basically works as a plus one because of the proliferate attached to it. Yeah, Vraska is really strong, and Vraska technically counts as an even mana value card for Gyruda. If that ends up mattering, probably not. We already have two odd mana value cards, and we're not particularly valuing even mana values too much higher. Swarm Saboteur. What on earth is this alchemy thing? When it deals combat damage to a player, conjure a virus beetle into your hand. That can be really annoying in the right deck. Yeah, that, that's pretty annoying. Search for Esconta, good for a really grindy kind of deck, but we'll take Vraska here. Keep taking the powerful Planeswalkers. And speaking of powerful Planeswalkers, I guess we'll take an Ugin. Ugin fits into any deck as a six mana removal spell that can then start spitting out two two spirits. Big fan of Ugin. We could also go for Cavalier of Night, which is probably stronger in a dedicated black deck. Any deck that's super heavy on black where the triple black restriction isn't that difficult. But it's early enough in the draft. I'll take the more flexible card here, I think, with Ugin fitting into pretty much anything. Reality Chip is strong. Can be a lot of card draw, but it is super slow. You have to spend two mana to play it, and you have to reconfigure it onto something. So you need an additional creature on board. Then you need to spend three mana to slap that onto that additional creature. Not a massive fan of that one. Uh, Lannery Storm's good at producing treasure, but a pretty aggressive card for what looks pretty controlling right now. Commence the end game's a lot of mana. Could take some kind of mana rock like Fire Mind Vessel or Bronze Walrus here. I think I'm super pumped about those, but at the same time, our curve is super high. If I take another six drop, we've got like nothing going on early, which is pretty bad. I guess I could take Lana or Loam Speaker. Maybe try to become Sultai, green, blue, and black. Use a bunch of green mana dorks as our early game plays. That could be reasonable. Most chromatic cube decks are going to end up in like three colors. So I think I should be speculating on a third color now, and I think green would be probably one of the easiest, one of the best ones. Take a dual land here, or a callous blood mage, or a spark double. Actually, spark double is really sweet with Gyruda. I was going to take some mana fixing here, but Spark Double Gyruda is pretty ridiculous because you can Gyruda mill four. If you mill a Spark Double, then you put the Spark Double on the board copying Gyruda. It becomes a non-legendary version of it, so both Gyruda and the Spark Double will stay on the board. And Spark Double will trigger Gyruda's second enter the battlefield effect to spin the wheel again and try to hit another card. Uh, Techio was a pretty good value play, but pretty slow. Zamone and Dina look similar, a good value play, but kind of slow. You have to sack creatures, but then you get to draw a card, put a land into play. That's solid. Slow. I think I'd rather just take a dual land here. Saiba Siphoner just returns an instant or sorcery from grave to hand. That's fine. A little expensive. Yeah, we'll just take a dual land for our Sultai deck. Take another dual land here with a Bark Channel Pathway. Sedgemore Witch is fine. If you have a lot of instants and sorceries, it's a good way to get expendable pest tokens to sacrifice for any of your sacrifice cards, like Zamone and Dina. But we have one instant right now, and that's it. I don't think we're going to be a good Sedgemore Witch deck. Pick 11 now, we've got a Vidalian Tide Mage. Whenever one of your creatures deals combat damage to a player, you get a duplicate into your hand. Interesting. 
Joint Exploration is just a medium draw spell. Zamone is a really slow card draw engine. I'm going to go for Joint Exploration here. Could go for Teferi if I want to go blue-white-black instead of blue-green-black. Take an Into the Royal or a Temple of Malice to speculate towards red. Take an Into the Royal. I think it's a very good piece of interaction. Two mana bounce anything if you need to, and if you have the mana to kick it, you get to draw a card as well to go to go replace your Into the Royal, which is pretty sweet. Take the Search for Ascanta, take the Reality Chip, and take the Commence the End game that I was considering taking earlier, so really happy I didn't take the Commence the End game. We'll see what we've opened up for pack two, pick number one. All right, there are several incredibly powerful options that I would love to take here. Salumgar's Command is really flexible interaction. So that would be quite sweet to stop our opponent from doing anything too explosive, hopefully. Uro Titan of Nature's Wrath is a super good value play that also ramps you up really quickly by putting extra lands into play. Also gains you life to keep you in the game against aggro. I think these two are the strongest cards by a lot. But after that, there's also Vizier the Menagerie to perfectly fix mana for creatures. Fauna Shaman to turn any creature into your hand into whatever the best creature at the time is. Get Rog Monster for a bunch of value as you sack lands. Feed the Swarm for good removal. A lot of incredible cards, but I'm going to go for Uro. I think one easy way to see if a card is going to be pretty good is to see when you highlight it if it shows up as being banned in like five formats. That's usually a pretty good sign, so we'll scoop up an Uro. Titan of Nature's Wrath. And now we've got a Watery Grave for a blue-black duel. That would be a sweet pickup, as would Fabled Passage for mana fixing. We have a Hostage Taker here, which is a really nice spell. It gets to be a removal spell for your opponent's best card, and if your opponent doesn't kill your Hostage Taker immediately, then you then get to cast their own card against them next turn. Usually how it plays out. Very, very, very strong. I think I'm going to go for the Hostage Taker here over the Mana Fixing. But we do want to have some amount of Mana Fixing. Probably should be taking Mana Fixing super, super highly, because Cube Drafts are formats where there's so many powerful cards that it's going to be pretty impossible to not end up with, like, 23 super powerful non-land cards. So taking the lands highly is usually the best thing to do, but... First Chromatic Cube of the Return, I'm going to take the splashy cards that I really want to play with, and Hostage Taker certainly fits that bill. Pack 2, pick 3. Not too much going on here. These dual lands aren't good for blue, black, green. Commit to Memory isn't the greatest interaction ever. It's fine. Make sure that you don't mill out late game as well, which is cute. I'm not super excited about that. Joel Rail. Kind of an army in a can. Keeps animating one of your lands and lets the land hit your opponent and draw you cards. It's interesting. Hoarding Broodlord is a ton of mana unless you have a lot of creatures to convoke it. I might go treasure map here. No matter what's going on with our mana, it's going to be a good early game play to set up our draws. And once we've used the scry ability three times, it also gives us three treasure tokens, which we can either use to draw cards off the treasure cove or to help fix our mana with their ability to sacrifice for a man of any color. So actually, I'm a pretty big fan of the treasure map. Now we've got some excellent interaction out of this pack. So we've got a blue-black dual land. We've got a pylon, which is just a strictly better version of Price of Fame. I guess Price of Fame is better against legends, but pylon can destroy creatures or planeswalkers instead of just creatures. And if we have any creatures on board, we can convoke it. So I think pylon is still better than Price of Fame. Better than Soul Transfer as well for this deck, because unless you have artifacts and enchantments on board, it's just going to be a one-for-one -one removal spell still. So I like Pylon a lot. I also like Incubation Druid. Tireless Tracker is a great value play, but I'm going to go for the removal spell. Take a Pylon here. Pack 2, pick 5. There's a Hydroid Krasis that is... Huge, huge, huge for a Soul Tide deck. This is one of the big top-end value plays that was super good in Soul Tide decks when this was still in Standard. So that is kind of the classic there. I'm going to go for it here. Inscription of Insight would be fine. Hard Evidence would be good just because it gives us another cheap card. 
and it seems like that's going to be something that's kind of hard to get in this cube getting your good one to three mana plays versus there's so many great like four five and six mana cards uh, like hydroid crisis is again another top end card so do want to consider the cards like hard evidence even though they don't look that good for that sweet i might i think i'm supposed to take this pathway um or the proving ground even but considering cultivate here it's mana ramp and fixing draws us two lands guaranteed to help get up to like six mana i'm actually gonna go cultivate here for that fixing uh, mana confluence is probably pretty good mana of any color we have to pay a life every time we use it but that's still nice Menagerie Curator is actually a really good alchemy card for cube drafts specifically because most of the time the creature types in your deck are going to be kind of all over the place so this will quite often draw you a card as you're casting creatures off of it. That being said it's only mana that you can use on creatures specifically. So if your deck isn't super high on creatures then it doesn't end up playing actually that incredibly well. We have Surgical Metamorph, enter the battlefield as a copy of any permanence except it's an artifact in addition to its other types. This can copy a Gyruda. Alright, I'm going to take a Metamorph here for another Gyruda spin, because that's always fun. We got the Salumgar's Command to come back, I'm pretty happy with that. Kind of think Gyruda is looking like a possibility... If I get like a third clone for Gyruda, I might try to play Gyruda in the companion slot. If I just know that every time I can respin the wheel with Spark Double or Metamorph or something, then Gyruda might be worth just fully building around. We'll see. I'll take a Watery Grave here. We are wheeling all those dual lands we were considering taking earlier, so that's nice. I'll take a Commit to Memory over Drill Rail. I think we have enough... Other finishery stuff, mainly Gyruda, Ashiok, Vraska. Gyruda and a few Planeswalkers, basically, to end the game. Now a Price of Fame for removal. Actually, you probably take the blue-black duel over that. Yeah, let's get some more fixing. Be interested to see how this deck wraps up. If Gyruda's going to be in the Companion, or just in the main deck. If we're going to be playing green or, lot, or not. If Gyruda isn't going to be in the companion slot, I think we're definitely going to be playing green for Cultivate and Uro and stuff. But if Gyruda ends up in the companion slot, there's only like two green cards in the deck. So we might end up cutting those and just being strictly blue-black. So we will see. Alright, pack three, pick number one. What do we have? Bunch of odd mana value cards. There's actually one really sweet even, which is Binding the Old Gods. It's a sorcery speed removal spell, but then it searches your library for any forest, puts it on the battlefield tap, then shuffles, which can usually mana fix you pretty well if you can pick up a Triome with forest in it. We don't have any lands to work with Binding the Old Gods here, though. If we had a green Triome, if we had the green, blue, black Triome, I think I'd slam dunk this, but right now all it would do is grab a forest, which... We wouldn't need because it requires a green mana to cast it anyway. Might just take red and seven for another super strong planeswalker. Holebreaker Horror is really strong, but super late game. Better with a lot of instants. Doom Whisper is just one standalone big dork. I'd rather have red and seven because they're potentially multiple big dorks in a row with that tree folk ability. All right, pack three, pick two, overgrown tomb. Seems pretty good. Settle the score also seems fine. We've got like three Planeswalkers in this deck, so this could be a removal spell that also buffs one of our Planeswalkers. Might wheel to settle the score, though. I think Overgrown Tomb is more important. This point. I don't like Teferi Master of Time very much. A lot of draw and discard. But Teferi just kind of annoys me more than anything, playing with or against Teferi Master of Time, honestly. You know what, I might take Saddle the Score over the Tomb. We've been wheeling a lot of lands. If we don't get the Tomb back, we might get the World Tree, which is also good fixing. Actually, take Saddle the Score. 
three planeswalkers is a lot for that. That seems like it could be pretty solid. Lutri the Spell Chaser. Well, if I don't play Garuda in the companion slot, I am guaranteed to be able to play Lutri in the companion slot, so scoop that up, I guess. Uh, Eldest Reborn is pretty strong. Snapcaster Mage is strong too, but we are very low on instants and sorcery, so we are not playing a good Snapcaster Mage deck. But if you're like blue-red with a bunch of cards like Fight with Fire and Lightning Bolt and stuff, Snapcaster can be sweet with a bunch of cheap red burn spells or cheap blue counter spells. We do not we do not have a lot of those though. I'm going to take a loot tree or an Eldest Reborn, but I'll take the loot tree. Grab a blue black dual land here. Not too much else. What is going on this pack? A whole lot of nothing it looks like. Yeah, not much I'm interested in. Discovery Dispersals seems okay. Cheap card draw or decent late game interaction. Yeah, I'll do that. Invasion of Fiora. Destroy all legendaries or all non-legendaries. It's interesting board wipe. I, I prefer like Dream Eater, but a board wipe might be Exactly what we're in for here. We have a bunch of single target removal, but yeah, being able to destroy all creatures, period, is probably pretty good for this deck. Take Invasion of Fiora. Now, we can't play Gigantha in the companion slot, so I'm not super up on that. I think I'll take a Sublime Epiphany. This is a lot of mana, but in cube draft formats, this thing is so explosive. Because every spell and every creature and everything like that in cube tends to be quite powerful. So when you counter one of your opponent's spells, copy one of your own creatures and draw a card, that's usually absolutely backbreaking. So we'll take Sublime Epiphany. Mythos of Nethroy. Three mana destroy a creature. Sure. Bunch of blue and black cards here. Still super low on the Spell Slinger front, so Spell Dancer and Mirari Conjecture look pretty bad. Hullbreaker Horror is strong, but ideally you want a lot of instants with it, and it's a ton of mana, so I think I'd rather just Doom Whisperer. I don't even know if I'm that pumped about that one. Now a Spell Thief. Temple of the Dragon Queen is basically Evolving Wilds, which isn't very good. It's the board tapped as just one specific color, and that's it. Just take a Chatterfang. I don't think I'll be playing that either, though. All right, we're going to have some deck building to do here. I think... I think I might end up just not playing the Gyruda in the companion slot. I think Kiritsugu and Kairi is actually very good in here. I'm gonna go for the Dream Eater. Now a Dragantha to the sideboard. Alright, I think I'm going to not play Gyruda in the companion slot. Because I would like to have a better mana curve and be able to play cards like Uro. And Renin 7, Ashiok, Salumgar's Command. We have a lot of really powerful odd mana value cards, ideally. We'd have to run some super filler stuff to run only evens. So with this deck, I don't think I'm that interested in the reality chip. Snowborn Simulacra, what does that even do? Draw a bunch of copies of non-token permanents that are on the board. And if you spend 7 mana on this total and you get to put one into play immediately so you kind of don't even want to do this till you have seven mana so it's another weird late game finisher i think i would rather play actual paper magic cards than alchemy cards to finish the game if i can afford to let's cut these three 
We have like no token production, so Chatterfang's not going to do much, but Uro, Cultivate seem great. Mythos of Nethroy's fine removal. So Spell Thief is kind of like a 3-mana three 3-2 three, flash draw card. Because just whatever your opponent plays on turn 3, you just cast this in response and put it into your hand. That seems fine on curve. Definitely going to keep Spark Double and Metamorph in to go with Gyruda if we get lucky with that. And they're still fun by themselves. Take out some of these counter spells. Whirler Rogue doesn't really work with our deck. Prince the end game is kind of expensive for just a little bit of card draw. Alright, yeah, I like everything in the deck now, but I still need to cut six more cards. Search for Escanta might be a little dirtily in here. Yeah, it'll be pretty slow to flip. We have a little bit of surveilling where we can mill ourselves with cards like Discovery and a little bit of Instance and Sorceries to end up in our grave early, but not like a ton. So I'll drop that out of the deck. Speaking of that, I'll probably drop Joint Exploration as well. We're cutting some of the more expensive stuff. Ugin's probably the weakest of the six drop. For greater spells. I like the Planeswalkers a lot better than this Doom Whisperer. And then cut a couple four drop things. It commits. One more cut to go. I kind of want to cut the Saddle the Square. Now we have two Planeswalkers in here total. No, we still have three Planeswalkers, but it's three instead of four, so it's still, it's less consistent. Four mana sorcery speed only remove a creature is, I think, the worst removal spell we have left in our deck. Yeah, I'm going to cut the Saddle the Score. Let's make sure our mana base looks good. It's going to be a difficult one here. We're very three color. We have 14 blue cards, 10 black, 5 green. But we want that green source early for Loam Speaker Cultivate. Four, five, six, seven green sources. That's not horrible. Ideally, one and eighth, I think, because I want that green on turn two, turn three. Uh, ten black cards. Currently, four, five, six, seven, eight black sources. And then more blue cards than anything else. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight blue sources, nine blue sources. So we have one more blue source than black and green. We have two double black cards in the deck, the three weird sisters and invasion of Fiora. Raska we can pay two life, Gyruda we can pay blue. But for green, we have one double green card with Ren and Seven, and again, our green cards are like Cultivate, Uro, and Llanowar, Loam Speaker, where we need that mana early. We don't need a black source until like turn five, because we could wait a little bit for a removal spell, we could wait a little bit for a pile on. Three Weird Sisters gets awkward mana-wise for that double black. Because that is a black spell we'd like to play early. Maybe we could cut that for another green card if there was anything decent. Doesn't look like there's any decent green cards, though, left in the sideboard. Could cut it for a blue card, though. Put a joint exploration or something back in. Seems fine, sure. Or Ugin. Oops, it's the wrong card. That is Search for Esconto. Let's put joint exploration back in. Uh, this way, the only double black card in the deck is Invasion of Fiora, which is like a board wipe, so it's going to be one of the latest spells that we're casting anyway. And then 8-8-9 eight, eight, seems pretty good on 8 green, 8 black, 9 blue. Yeah, let's call it a mana base, call it a deck. Hop into the gameplay. All right, here we are for game one with a definite keep. We need to draw one more land, but then Cultivate can get us to where we're casting all of these spells. We have drawn our one more land. Pass the turn. 
We've got all three of our colors. Cultivate's going to make sure we have double green and double black. Do I have double blue cards in this deck? I do have a couple, right? Yeah, Sublime Epiphany, Dream Eater. Uh, opponent starts with the Swarm Saboteur, which is the really annoying Virus Beetle producer. I'm going to enter the Royal right now so we don't have to deal with that. Because we know that we want to spend our three mana on a Cultivate next turn. Which would leave us with no blockers for the Swarm Saboteur. And I am going to Cultivate to guarantee we can play a 5 drop next turn and get an Ashiok onto the board. So let's go. We only have one double back card in the deck. Let's go for a blue and a green. I guess I only have one double green card in the deck as well, but... I think it's kind of coin flippy whether we want the second black or second green. A little bit more black cards, though. Maybe should have taken the second black. Ooh, we've got a Gyruda turn five. All right, our opponent dropped... Or Gyruda turn six? No, turn five, because we ramped up. If we draw land, then we can Gyruda turn five. So whenever they deal combat damage to us, they're going to draw a card. Let's bounce that back to their hand and make them exile a card being as annoying as possible. To overcome your fears. And then we're just going to start spitting out two threes for blockers. Into the Ren and Realmbreaker. Oh, haste out of the green, blue, black deck. Yeah, that'll kill Ashiok, and we have not hit land six for Gyruda. That was about as big of a bummer as that turn could have been. Fair enough, can't really play around haste coming out of a Sultai deck. It'll certainly get us. Drop our Hydroid Crisis to draw a card, trying to hit the sixth land, and we did find it, so we will be able to play a Gyruda. Can even Sublime Epiphany making a copy of a Gyruda. It'll die to the Legend rule, but it'll get the Enter the Battlefield trigger, so that would be a pretty fun thing to do in the future. Gix with Ren and Realm Breaker is kind of disgusting. But, actually, if I block the land, then they're down a mana here, so... Actually, not that bad. Because it's not like they're producing a haste token every turn. That's like an actual land of theirs that's attacking me. Let's just slam down Gyruda and see what happens. Spark Double? Oh my god, we hit Spark Double. Let's go. Oh, we hit Spark Double and Metamorph at the same time. That's kind of sad. Oh my god, Gyruda into Spark Double into Dream Eater. Hit a Hostage Taker and have an Uro in Grave to escape. Oh my god. And now we bounce. Something. I think bouncing either of these is fine. What does this start at? Four, it's up to six. Sure, I'll bounce the Planeswalker. Well, that was a great Gyruda turn. That was some really good stuff. That's the uh, Gyruda Spark Double combo right there. That was unreasonable. Absolutely absurd. Grim Flare. 4-4 four, four, Trample. When it deals combat damage to us, they get to Surveil 3. Collective Brutality, make us discard an instant or sorcery. So there goes Sublime Epiphany. Sure. Got a Hostage Taker. Could steal and immediately cast a Grim Flayer. Seems plenty good to me. Uh, 
send in the squad of gigantic creatures, and they're down to three life as we pass the turn. There's a growth spiral from our opponent. And that's going to be it. Absolutely explosive stuff from Gyruda. The luck of having the Gyruda with the spark double in the top four. Horrendous. Evil, evil stuff as we are 1-0 heading into game two. Here we are now for game two. We've got all three colors and an into the royal for early game. So I'm going to keep it here. Playing against whites. White, red, Boros stuff, and Thraben Inspector will start things off as a great value play. A 1-2 that comes with a clue token to draw them a card. Let's put our loot tree into hand and pass the turn. Take our 1 damage down to 19. There's a Welcoming Vampire, so whenever another creature with power 2 or less enters the battlefield under their control, they get to draw a card. So pretty aggressive deck here with some great value plays rolling out. I'm going to pass turn here and we're going to pile on or into the Royal, their Welcoming Vampire, before their next creature resolves so that we can counter their card draw. Okay, well, Winoda is not going to draw them a card off of Welcoming Vampire anyway. I would rather... Whenever a non-human attacks, it triggers. So I guess I could still uh, just pile on the Welcoming Vampire, but I think it's pretty cool to just kill Winota before that trigger happens. Uh, I do want to hit six mana, but I need another black source for this Invasion of Fiora, so I think I actually mill the island. Keep the Vraska. Maybe a little greedy, but I think I am going to keep Vraska. Take three damage down to 16. So I could drop a Vraska, turn their Welcoming Vampire into a treasure token, and Vraska still has four loyalty. Or I could hold on Slumgar's command ready to... Bounce a card and kill the vampire, or counter an on creature spell, kill the vampire, do something and kill the vampire seems fine. Yeah, let's go for Salumgar's command here. If they don't cast anything that Salumgar's command works well against, we can just into the royal. Oh my god. Um This cannot counter a siege gang commander. Could enter the royal the welcoming vampire now, and then I can Slumgar's command to kill the siege gang itself and bounce one of the goblin tokens later. That actually seems kind of legitimate. I'm gonna go for that. And this draws me another card towards the black source. For a board wipe that I'm inevitably gonna have to use sometime soon. Sublime Epiphany. Okay, not beautiful. I think I just need to main phase this before they have the mana up to fling goblins at me. Yep, let's do it. So I take three damage on board, go down to 12. Jaya, Fiery Negotiator. Now that I have cast my Planeswalker removal spell. Get out there and blaze a path. There's a Cultivate, so we will have Invasion of Fiora mana next turn, but I'll only have three mana up this turn. Yeah, I think this is just a turn too late. Oh, I don't have another island in the deck? Well, it's a good thing I tapped like that. To have my double blue up for Lutri. Because I'm going to need to chump.
They're gonna draw a card off Welcoming Vampire from Jaya. You're no match for my students. Oh my god, and a Captain Lannery? Well, I was thinking maybe I would Invasion of Fiora just destroying all non-legendaries, but now they have two good legendaries. So I'll blow up everything. I was thinking that maybe leaving Lutri around after it just kills a 1-2 or something here to attack Jaya would be okay, letting them keep a Magda, but if they have a Magda and a Lannery, we're just going to kill everything with Invasion of Fiora. I don't even know if I survive. Probably do. Survive this attack. But barely. Definitely have to block Lannery. Because Lannery can be 4 power. Down to 6. Jaya is 2 away from an ultimate. Can't do anything but Invasion of Fiora here. Yep, do the Invasion. And they've got a clue token to draw a card still. Could have Metamorph become a copy of Invasion of Fiora? That's actually really nice. And we have a second board wipe in our hand just in case. Oh my god, I didn't even know Jaya had an ability like that. A draw to ability? And they hit an Elspeth? Well, we need a board wipe that can hit Planeswalkers. I don't believe we have one. Like return my Salumgar's command from grave to hand. That would be nice. Ooh, Ren and seven. Make a seven seven reach. I have two mana up. It's not enough to do anything else. Could play Uro and have four mana up to play a Metamorph, but that would be it. If I hit a land off Uro, then I can play Uro and Renin 7, which is really, really tempting, but probably much too greedy. I could just hold up a Sublime Epiphany, but then... Doesn't even really do anything, unless they cast something. Feels too narrow to try to rely on that. Alright, I'm not going to try to rely on a top deck here. I'm going to get my 7-7 seven, seven down for a blocker. Intrepid Adversary, which they can kick three times thanks to the treasure. So they can give their whole board plus three plus three. As long as that's on board, it might be about time to make a copy of Invasion of Fiora. Just already. Oh my lord. A blast to the noggin gets results. Sure, yeah, I'm just going to board wipe anyway, so we'll take the trade. Four mana to make a copy of Invasion of Fiora. And I have four mana to do whatever else I want. I can make another run in seven. The spark double? Seems legit. All right. Cards. Yeah, I can do the mill thing. Oh, I milled an Ashiok. Sadness. 
We might be grinding it out here. Feels sketchy. We've got two Renin 7s on board now. Got Renin 14 out here. They only have two cards in hand, but they have Jaya's ability to minus and draw cards off the top. Yep, that's what they're going to go for. And that's two spells again for choices. One of which is Plarg, Dean of Chaos. They go for Augusta, Dean of Order. Buffs all their creatures and lets them untap them all. Kind of stuff. There's Alesha, who smiles at death, which can reanimate a bunch of stuff from Grave. Power two or less, which is a lot of their deck. That is a majority of their creatures, so we need to kill Alesha. So... God, what do I do? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 mana total. I can't play Vraska and hold up Sublime Epiphany, which is a big bummer. So I'll play Uro and Vraska. Could escape Uro. Don't have Vraska mana up if I do that, or Joint Exploration mana up. I'm gonna make these things gigantic. No, I need to. I need to Vraska so that they can't Alesha back a Siege Gang Commander or something. I think I want to cash in one of these Renin 7s to have two blockers up here. And the other one set up to make another creature. Down to 11 cards, so I don't think I'm going to want to plus again. I'm just going to want minus and then zero. Ideally. Well, I feel like I've been playing on borrowed time here, so happy to be here at this point. Ah, I'm no longer happy at all. <laughs> Taught them everything they know. Oh, I played enough of that in Phyrexia All Will Be One. I did not know that was in the cube. Well, we're dead because we can't play another Invasion of Fiora. Actually, I could return. <laughs> I don't have enough mana. Oh, wait, I could return my... Uh... Oh, my God. I returned my Surgical Metamorph to my hand with Sublime Epiphany. Right? And then replay it. I do have enough mana for that. Okay. Return a non-land permanent to hand. Target player draws a card. Non-land permanent is going to be Surgical Metamorph. I'm going to draw a card. Don't have the mana to play this Spell Thief in response. To have another Sublime Epiphany in my hand. Invasion of Fiora again. There we go. Now... Make a Tree Folk. Draw a card, Proliferate. Maybe I shouldn't have drawn the guard. Seems good though, they're at two cards in hand. We've got a bunch, I need to not mill out, but... They have no creatures on board, we have a bunch of cards in hand and 11-11 on board. They can make two tokens every turn though, thanks to Jaya and Elspeth. And Harmonious Archon turns our thing into a 3-3, but we have a Dream Eater for that. Get out there and blaze a path. Jesus Christ, it's so many creatures in one turn. Okay, I don't really want a Dream Eater and put that back in their hand. Dream Eater only targets things our opponents control, so we can't Dream Eater our own <laughs> Surgical Metamorph again. That would be so funny, though. We have to bounce the Elspeth for it to not ultimate. 
Okay. Leaves me with six mana to play around with. Probably Spell Thief the Dream Eater. Oh my god. Oh my god, I did it too at the wrong time. Oh wait, no, it's just the power toughness. Okay, they keep the abilities, thank god. Okay. For a second I thought it took away all the abilities, but no, they, they keep the abilities. Bunch of lands and consider. Well, I can't really mill these, so I guess I'm just gonna hit all of them. I'm not gonna cast a consider. Bounce Elspeth. Alright, I thought I misordered stuff there to where I was going to get really demolished for playing that way, but no, I'm good. Okay. I guess... We can get rid of a 1-1 one -one here. Because I don't need four blockers at eight life against four one ones. They're gonna scoop them up. All right. Well, I thought that was gonna be a super close game on future turns. Because I don't know. I feel like they still had. Uh, Oh, it's there, especially with like seven cards left in my deck. But they are over it. Yeah, I guess I guess if their other card in hand is just another land or something irrelevant, all they can do is play Elspeth, make two more 1-1s one on the ground, or they could make one of their creatures a flyer with Elspeth's minus two, but then I bounce whatever they give flying, and then I get to start sniping their planeswalkers one by one because we've knocked out all of their uh, flying creatures there. So that would be the plan. We can minus Vraska or use Dream Eater to get rid of the flying blocker, use the flyer to snipe probably Elspeth first, then Jaya. And from then on, just jam in with all this stuff. Yeah, I was super worried there. Down to seven cards in library where all of our strongest plays that we wanted to do require us to mill even more. That's why I didn't surveil any of these into the graveyard, because I'm going to want to use Raska Zero a couple times again so that I can get Ren and Seven up to being able to make another Tree Folk, which means I'm going to have to draw a couple more cards. I'm going to want to put a 6-6 six, six Uro on board, which means I'm going to have to gain some life and draw a card and then gain some life and draw a card when I attack with it. So there's a lot of things forcing me to draw a card soon, so I think I might have even drawn a little too much. But our opponent does scoop in the end. Really long game, really close one. But we grind it out in the end. Really good work from that clone that copies any non-land permanent. Didn't even realize that because it was one of those new alchemy cards I don't really play with. Once I saw that combination, I thought I was 100% dead till I read that. And I was like, wait a second, we can copy our board wipe battle... And then we managed to bounce our own clone and copy the battle again to board wipe again. That was sweet. That was some sweet nonsense synergies giving us the second win as we head into game number three now. Undefeated so far. And we are on the play with a turn three cultivate. You love to see that. We've also got the surgical metamorph, the MVP of last game. Works quite well with a battle that uh, wipes the board when it enters the battlefield. Ren 7 was very good last game, as was Dream Eater. The gang's all here. A lot of great stuff. Ooh, a turn 3 Uro. If I draw a fourth land, I'll play Uro. But if I don't have a fourth land in hand to where I don't know if I'll even get to play an extra land off Uro, then I'll wait on it. Yeah, that's awkward. I'll go cultivate first then to guarantee the double ramp. I've already got double black off Xander's Lounge, so let's get a blue source so we have double blue and a green source so we have double green. We 
could play a turn four Renin Seven or a turn four Ashiok. Good lord. All kinds of stuff to choose. Our opponent's ramping up two Gilded Goose into Cultivator's Caravan. It's not bad at all. Hinterland Harbor is a beautiful land. Let's. Let's just run in seven here. Let's go for the beef. Boom. Five, five. It's going to be a six, six next turn. It's going to be aided by a Dream Eater or an Ashiok or whatever we need to do. They're going to pass the turn stuck on two mana here. Might play out really poorly for our opponent. Um, Don't really want to bounce the goose. I'm cool with a chump block here. They can't crew the vehicle with it. The one thing that's slightly sketchy about this is I won't be leaving up a flying or reach blocker for Ren and Seven. I guess I could just hold up Dream Eater. But I kind of want to just slam down Ashiok. You know, I think it's reasonable to hold on to our instance here. Let's pass the turn and just flash in a Dream Eater to interact with whatever they're trying to do. Could even bounce the Gilded Goose now to put them down a mana. It would be pretty rude while they're stuck on mana here. Now that might actually be worth it. I'm going to go for it. Ooh, get a spark double for the Renin 7. Get rid of land, land, land. And then we can use Renin 7 to... Wait, they don't pick up lands from Grave, do they? I don't know. Well, we're filling the Grave for Uro, I guess. They put lands from hand onto the board. That's what they do. Alright, let's bounce the Gilded Goose so they don't have that extra food token being used on mana next turn. They're stuck on three mana. Replay the Gilded Goose. Fortella card. Here's the Spark Double. Forgot to plus one Ren and seven last turn. That was dumb. Alright, I can Spark Double and into the Royal now, though. Yeah, I should have had another. Tree folk this turn. Instead of Renin 7, we go all the way up to Renin 21. Omnath, Locus of Creation. Draw a card, but they are dead on board. All right, and that is going to end the game. Not too much to say about that one. Bit of a bummer. Our opponent was just very mana screwed the whole time, so they didn't get to cast a lot of spells. But that will make us 3 and 0 oh now. At least a 50-50 run from our nice little soul tie pile. So we head into game 4. Alright, here's our opening hand for game 4. Doesn't look super keepable to me with 3 blue cards in the hand and no blue source. We do have a black source for the Mythos of Nethroi, but I take the mulligan here. Alright, much better mana. We'll go for this. Uh, I really liked the Invasion of Fjord. I think I'm going to keep that. I don't... I mean, I guess I could just get rid of a land, keep Consider, but I feel like I should keep all my lands if I'm going to keep Invasion of Fiora. Means maybe get rid of Spell Thief for Slumgar's Command. Sure, I'll get rid of Slumgar's Command and hope Invasion of Fiora just kills everything. Ooh, a treasure map for turn two. That'll fill out the mana curve quite well. Gives us a mana sink for one extra mana whenever we have it. Sets up our draws. Another land. Uh, yeah, I do need another black source, but I've already got Catacomb Mana Confluence, but I'll still take it. We've got the treasure map to scry out of any additional lands if I flood out super hard or something. I'm gonna stop on my upkeep in case I want to scry there, but I'm probably just going to hold up the mana for Futurist Spell Thief and then scry during our opponent's end step. One, two, three, four, five...
So we do need to draw one more land. Hopefully our opponent plays something cool here and we can get a copy into our hand. If they're paying life on Godless Shrine, then they probably are playing something cool. Hedron Archive? Not actually that cool. Yeah, I'm just going to let that resolve in Treasure Map here. If they ramp into one really big dork, we pile on. If they ramp into something that puts a lot of dorks down, we invasion of Fiora. We should be fine. And Spell, Spell Thief doesn't stop their Hedron Archive from doing anything. It just gives us a copy, too. Alright, let's scry one. That will be land number six. Our second green source, too, which is valuable. I'll take it. Holding up Spell Thief, or Pylon, and if I Spell Thief, then I can cast Spell Thief and use the treasure map, which is super sweet. They have seven mana up. Relic of Legends, it's just all mana rocks, the deck. 17 lands, 23 mana rocks. Maybe it's a bunch of removal in their hand right now. Past turn, so let's scry. Metamorph? And yeah, it's really good with Invasion of Fiora. If I need to double up my board wipes. Could scry again to immediately get my treasure tokens, but we know what we're drawing and we're cool with the draw. What happens when this flips? If there are three or more, transform it, create three treasures, so. I spend three mana. I spend one mana to get three. So if I spend three right now on Lutri, I could still flip a treasure map and play a spell thief if I need to. So I can go ahead and get this mana cost out of the way, putting Lutri into hand. Ideally, I don't want to have to spend treasure tokens on the spell thief. Because uh, every treasure token can turn into a full on card draw from the treasure map. But just as a. If I need to. Do I need a copy of the Wandering Emperor? Not really. Yeah, I'll just pile on that in the future and board wipe all the samurai they make. Five mana. Angel of Invention. Big one. Big one for sure. Buffs the board with plus one, plus one, and gives them two more one ones to buff up. Wandering Emperor is going to plus one to get a counter onto the Samurai, deal more damage to me. I have got new moves to teach you. And they're going to slap me with a Guardian Idol. All right. Well, I didn't really want to Spell Thief copy an Angel because I was just going to board wipe, but Spell Thief trade into Guardian Idol seems kind of okay. I guess, actually, you know what we do here. We take this damage because they're tapped out. So we take this damage and then treasure map out a Lutri. So I have a Legendary on the board, because they don't have a Legendary on the board. Losing a little bit of card draw here, but I think it's worth it, because this is going to let me Invasion of Fiora. Blow up all non-Legendaries, and then also kill the Wandering Emperor. need a man of any color up. I'm going to hold up Treasure Co. to be able to crack that and draw a card. Mm. 
Now Lutri kills the Wandering Emperor. And they're down to two cards in hand. We have four in hand, plus a card draw from this treasure, plus an invasion to potentially flip. Feels like a great position. They do have two more cards if they want them. They can crack their Hedron Archive to draw two. That's not like massively in our favor, but I do think we are in the lead now. A decent margin. There's a Ravenous Chupacabra to kill Lutri and give them a 2-2. Two -two. They're going to activate the Guardian Idol to put me down to 9. Burrow's going to give us a good amount of life gain here to keep us in this. Let's draw our card. Oh my god, and a Hydroid Crisis? That is going to be obnoxiously good. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. That's going to be a 6-6 six, six and we draw 3, giving us a full grip of 7. And putting us up to 11 life here. Feels good. Feels very good. It also snipes the Invasion of Fiora in one hit. And here comes the Sacrifice of the Hedron Archive to draw two. And there's the Pylon for Hydroid Krasis. Part of what's so strong about the Hydroid Krasis is that even if it gets killed, it drew us three extra cards, so it kind of feels like a four for one, where they spent one pile on to deal with one quarter of what Hydroid Crisis did. Okay. Could just metamorph a Chupacabra. Chupacabra, their Chupacabra. But I've also got. I have Raska and Pylon and Mythos of Nethroi, so I have so much. Um, removal in hand anyway. I think it's fine to spend one of these on the Chupacabra. Sure, there's better ways to spend my mana here, but I'm just gonna throw out some spells. I, mean, I guess there's not a huge reason not to Vraska. I guess the Guardian Idol can hit Vraska, which is an issue. I can actually black, green, white with Mythos of Nethroi and blow up the Guardian Idol, which is pretty sweet. Then I still have Spell Thief up. I might actually just pass here and hold up all the instant speed stuff. We have Pylon, Mythos of Nethroi, and Futurist Spell Thief. There's an embarrassment of riches here. Hard to know exactly what the best line is going to be when we have so many different options. I'm just going to go for the interaction side of things. They are just going to poke with Chupacabra, leave the Guardian Idol back. Fair enough. I'll take the two here, go to ten. Playing an X Mana spell or something? Play a Thalia's Lancers. When it enters the battlefield, search for a legendary reveal, put it in their hand, then shuffle. A four mana or less legend here. Is that what's going on? Hopefully it's a sweet one and I'll spell thief that. I've been so greedy with the spell thief. I should have just cashed it in like a century ago, I think. Alright. Spell thief on a Soren's fine. Then I can um, convoke Pylon using the spell thief to blow up the planeswalker. And I can metamorph the Invasion of Fiora to blow up all the creatures. I bring order to this broken world. Have the board state clear again. They have one card in hand. 
you can deal with my servant. Against our board state. I could Mythos of Nethroy Soren instead. I could do either of these. I'll go for the pylon. I get to surveil this way. Darkness, land, land. Get that out of here. Still have 19 cards in the library after that, so that's fine. Cool. Metamorph the invasion. Blow everybody up. Drop a Soren. I'm gonna hold up Mythos of Nethroi here. Oath of Kaya, three damage to any target. Goodbye, Soren. You weren't long for this world, I'm sorry. Oh, blow up the token. Alright. I guess because they're going to try to Guardian Idol Soren. That would be great in theory. But I do have three cards in hand that are all non lands. Pay without the mana confluence because I can just blow up a creature. All right, hostage taker is the draw. Strong one. All right, let's make a 6-6 six, six Uro. Still 17 cards left in the deck, so 16 cards, then I Vraska. Fifteen card. Oop. Fifteen cards. After this draw, and I proliferate onto Soren to get a two-three, and keep Soren on board. Yeah, we are just a snowball that is not going to stop rolling now. Pass the turn. There's an anguished unmaking to get rid of Raska. Teleportation circle, they can flicker one of their artifacts or creatures every turn, but they don't have any left. Can Spark Dublin still hold up a Dream Eater? Just get another Sworn and go full vampire mode here. You can deal with my servant. I probably should flip one of these invasions, but I'm getting to the amount of card draw that I'm getting slightly sketched out about milling myself. And uh, Marchesa draws us a card every turn as well. Alright, there's the concession from our opponent. Absolutely absurd game there. The big, the big flip with the invasion of Fiora being... Incredible early in that game, being able to wipe their entire board while keeping a Lutri on ours so we could blow up all their creatures and then just attack their Planeswalker. That was the big tipping point there, and from that point on, we were kind of just grinding out uh, from a position pretty pretty far ahead the rest of that game. So we are now 4 and oh, 3,000 gold no matter what. We do need to win one more game to break even. But we're doing really great on win rate so far, so feels great. Good stuff from the Soul Tide deck as we head into round five. All right, here we are for game number five. This is a monocolored hand, but it features a treasure map and a discovery to surveil two draw a card and scry a bunch. So this is a bit greedy, but I'm hoping that these cards take us a long way towards fixing the mana. We find a green source early. The Lana War Loam Speaker is going to be phenomenal. And as long as we keep hitting land drops, we should be fine. We can curve out Discovery into Treasure Map plus Scry, into Pylon, into Slumgar's Command, and we do hit a Watery Grave. 
Uh, yeah, I'm gonna shoot myself in the face here to discovery. There is the green source. We next turn we play mana confluence cultivate. I'm gonna be shooting myself in the face a lot. Shoot myself again down to 17 and then keep shooting myself with mana confluence, but that seems okay against Esper. Blue, white, and black, pretty slow trio. Generally. Okay, so I have mana confluence for any color. So I already have double black, double blue. So we need to get a green source to have double green. And then I've already got another black source in hand. All four of my lands currently are black, so let's get another blue. Feels good. We'll have five mana up next turn. I could hold up a Salamgar's Command, but I could also play a Loam Speaker and still hold up a Spell Thief. So if they play something strong, we Spell Thief a copy. And then by getting another Mana Dork on board, it should be a lot easier to hold up Salamgar's Command next turn. Is that strong? Whenever land enters the battlefield, put a loyalty counter. Plus one, untap a land, make it a 3-3 haste till end of turn. Haste and menace. Spooky. Okay. Okay, that's not like super, super strong. But if I play a spell thief, then I'll be able to just attack Nissa and kill her next turn. So because I'm going to want to attack and kill Nissa anyway, I might as well get a copy into my hand rather than playing spell thief in the end step and not drawing a card. So they only get the 3-3 three, three till the end of turn, so we get to attack Nyssa for 6 next turn, with Loam Speaker turning a land into a 3-3 three, three and Spell Thief being 3 damage. So, just kill Nyssa. And I shall... So... Land gets haste, right? Yeah, 3-3 three, three with haste. We say goodbye to Nyssa. And then hold up Slumgar's command. Nah, I've got great removal. Something can resolve. I guess I should have just played Nyssa here. Also, get the mana investment out of the way for Lutri treasure map. Probably should have just played Nyssa since I have the great removal in my hand anyway. But this is fine too, makes the use of all of our mana, gets gets a lot of these um, initial costs out of the way while we can afford to spend time doing that rather than affecting the board. I guess if I hit a land, I'll have eight mana to play a Slumgar's Command and copy with Lutri. Don't know how likely that is to actually do anything. I doubt there's going to be a position where we can counter two non-creature spells on the stack. But who knows? I believe the way that commands work with copies is that the copy is going to have the same modes, but you can choose new targets for the modes. So if I play a Slumgar's command to counter a non-creature and give something minus three, minus three, then my copy also is just counter spell, give a thing minus three, minus three. Voracious Hydra, not bad at all, because it's a removal spell on a stick. So even if I kill the Voracious Hydra, it already killed one of our cards, so they won't be down a card or anything. Oh, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven mana. Five for Slumgar's Command leaves me two to do whatever I want. Not enough. Could play Nyssa and Pylon. The Hydra. Seems fine. Two blue sources, one green. So we play this on green. Hold up. I'm a fool. I can pile on and um, convoke with Spell Thief, and then I can do it at instant speed, but then I guess if they have a Counterspell or Hexproof spell, they can save the Hydra and then attack Nyssa, so I kind of still want a main phase pile on. 
Yeah, I'm still just gonna main phase pile on this thing. Protect Nissa. Hostage Taker Uro. Well, those are good cards. I will keep them. So, what does Nissa even do with the ultimate? We get to put a creature mana value less or equal to the number of lands we control. So, any creature. Onto the battlefield from our hand or graveyard with two counters on it. Wow. Alright. We don't have any great creatures to do that with yet, but that is a really strong ability. Well, I cannot hostage take her that paradise druid. Let's just... I'm not going to cast anything here, so I guess I scry with treasure map right now and just get that cost out of the way because Nissa gets to untap the land anyway. Trade Spell Thief into Paradise Druid to protect Nissa seems fine, so I'll hold up for that. Then I can spend Slumgar's Command on other stuff. Lotus Cobra. That is a sweet card. Whenever they play a land, they get a man of any color. There's a Vivian. Yeah, spooky enough Planeswalker. Counter that non-creature spell. Give uh, Paradise Druid minus three minus three while it is not hexproof. And then I can just hostage take the Lotus Cobra here. And cast it. And our opponent is going to scoop them up. That was an interesting game, because Nissa was actually putting in a lot of work for extra mana and extra damage, so Futurist Spell Thief. Definite MVP there. Get to snipe their Nissa and play Nissa against them. Get the extra mana and extra menace attacks in there. Sweet stuff. We are 5-0 now. Getting 4,000 gold and 3 cards out of the event. We are in the money and undefeated so far. Feels great no matter what happens now. Pretty great record. At least 5 wins out of the Chromatic Cube Draft event. But we'll see how far we can keep it up. As we head into game 6, we are on the play. We don't have a blue source for this crisis, but Loam Speaker can attempt to solve that problem as long as they don't blow up our Loam Speaker. So I'll keep the hand. With Loam Speaker, we can even Mythos of Nethroid destroy any non-land permanent we can pay the green-white cost to. Which is interesting, that wasn't even something I considered when I put this in my deck, I just put it in as kind of a worse, well, kind of a better murder, I guess, a black and two instant destroy a creature. But we actually do have Loam Speaker and Mana Confluence, so sometimes we could even destroy non-land permanents, non-land non-creature permanents with Mythos of Nethroid. Confusingly worded card, but... Uh, if you spend black, green, white, you blow up any non-land card. Playing against green, white, red. Here's emergent sequence. Maybe five color. Yeah, green, white, red, blue at least. Uh, Mythos of Nethroi can't blow up a land creature, but Pylon can blow up a land creature. And I would like to keep them off of their bonus mana, so I think I'm just going to immediately pile on this island. Surveil into Discovery Dispersal, not that interesting. Fourth Land is pretty good with Hydroid Crisis, though. And Uro. We want to keep hitting mana. There's a Lotus Cobra. And a Black Source. So every color but blue now for them. Lotus Cobra produces a white, but nothing to spend it on. They pass the turn. Now I can consider and... Mythos the Cobra. Again, I think just locking them off mana feels pretty good. I 
I actually probably just shouldn't have spent the um, spent the life there. Because I do want to cast Consider. So I'll just poke them for one and cast a Consider. Spend two life to deal one damage to our opponent. Not the greatest trade deal in the history of trade deals, but it's a thing. And now they just cast nothing. Let's consider. Grab uh, another land. So we have six mana for Krasis for draw two. Even if they blow it up immediately. Sure. Draw two, get a 4-4 Flying Trample. Back up to 20. Pass the turn. There's the blue source, and that means Niv-Mizzet Reborn gets cast here. Does Niv-Mizzet draw them any cards? Exactly two color cards. Niv-Mizzet draws them Invasion of New Phyrexia. Oh, no. Okay, so next turn, they get four two twos. So we need to find, like, Invasion of Fiora or something. Or just beat them down super, super aggressively. Okay, so I can Uro, because Uro puts the land in untapped. So I can play Uro and Hostage Taker their niv -Mizzet. So if they just tap out for the Invasion of New Phyrexia, then they obviously can't kill our Hostage Taker, which means we can cast a niv -Mizzet against them. I guess if they kill the Hostage Taker, though, they get another niv -Mizzet Enter the Battlefield effect, which could be bad for me, but that would also mean that they're not casting this thing and getting, like, four two twos. so I think it's probably, all in all, a fine thing to do. Tap land. Leyline Binding. All right, get rid of Hostage Taker. Get another spin of the Niv Mizzet. Another one or two cards. It looks like get a Sfella and a Binding of the Old Gods. Actually, probably Escape to the Wilds. Binding of the Old Gods is the choice. Yep. Draw spell and removal spell. Well, we need like our board wipe. We're we're out of here. Cycle this to draw a card. Sublime Epiphany. Six mana up. That is very interesting. They have several really, really powerful cards, though, because they're a five color deck, so I'm sure they have six absolute bangers. They've got at least three with the Invasion and the Binding and Escape to the Wilds. We're only going to be able to stop one of their things with this Sublime Epiphany, but still be pretty good. They're just going to pass turn. They have their own Sublime Epiphany then, because everything that we know of in their hand is a sorcery speed card. So they have all of this and like a seven mana instant, like a Sublime Epiphany. All right, well, that's not good. <laughs> that is, in fact, quite bad. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I can spend three to put Lutri in hand, still hold up Sublime Epiphany. I could spend four on Uro and still hold up Sublime Epiphany. That feels better. Draw Surgical Metamorph. Interesting. Not for me right now, but will be interesting in the future. Not my current cup of tea. All right, they held up all their mana and then did nothing for that turn. Ugin. And they're tapping out for this. So if I counter Ugin and bounce their niv -Mizzet, they're just dead. So we do that. Counter, bounce a copy draw a card and th this should just be game right i could even bounce the leyline binding no i can't because they can afford that they have every land type they can't afford nimizit so bounce nimizit 
copy of definitely not hydroid crisis loam speaker i guess because Uro was legendary um and then we draw a card all right that should just win the game we have lethal on board thanks to the loam speakers yep they scoop them up so i guess they were just like playing around a sublime epiphany last turn or something i don't know Play around the Epiphany last turn, and then it's like, we resolve an Uro, so now they have to resolve something to not be in a bad position, so they have to attempt to cast something, and then we can just win with the Sublime Epiphany. It was a little weird, I don't know. I'd love to see what else they had in hand. They pr they had probably at least some kind of instant there. Maybe they did have their own Epiphany, but once we resolved an Uro, they couldn't just like sit there holding it up or anything. Alright. Incredible work from Sublime Epiphany. Obviously, just the absolute game winner there. Once they tap out, counter their spell, and expand our board state, and mega lethal it out. So we are now 6-0, and I think. Undefeated six games in a row, only one more to go until we're at a full seven-win run. Will it be a completely undefeated deck? Will it be a 6-3? 6-0 six six oh into 6-3 is always a pretty big bummer, but still a good record overall. Who knows? We'll find out as we head into game number seven, first round of the final boss. Here we are for game number seven with incredible late game cards. Nothing great early, but having at least that into the Royal, I think, makes it keepable. We go Xander's Lounge into Hinterland Harbor untapped. Try to into the Royal their early aggro and then start playing some absolute bangers. We might have to play a four mana Hydroid Crisis, but we'll see. Ooh. They don't have cheap removal. Turn two land where Loam Speaker is going to be beautiful, but they probably do. Okay, they've got a Cathar Commando. They're on black, green, and white. We are going to take some early damage. That's a two mana three one. Oh, they're not going to attack. Never mind. We are not going to take some early damage yet. Past the turn, it's going to be obvious that I have something up here because I'm not casting Lutri, but that's okay. Planning to future Spell Thief if I don't need to into the Royal, and kick an into the Royal if I do need to into the Royal. Alright, that's interesting. Uh, if I Spell Thief, they can't just minus two my Loam Speaker, which is pretty good. And I get my own Liliana, which is okay. Yeah, let's Spell Thief. So they can't just, uh, can't just make me sack Loam Speaker. Which actually means their Liliana just dies. Oh my god, this Spell Thief is so good against cheap Planeswalkers. It has annihilated Anissa, and now it's about to annihilate a Liliana. Right? Like, they can... They can minus Liliana, then I sack the Spell Thief and hit their Liliana with a 3-3. Or they can plus Liliana, in which case I still play my own and minus 2, kill their Cathar Commando, kill their Liliana with both my creatures. Yeah, that's super just rough time for our opponent. So now I know I'm going to tap out for Liliana next turn. So Into the Royal gets less exciting. Lovraska's real slow. Krasis and Garuda pretty slow. I still kind of want the interaction here. I'm going to get rid of... I don't know. I'm still going to get rid of Into the Royal. Hard choice, though. Okay, let's see. This pans out for us. Oh, I imagine it will. Cool. Beautiful. Alright, Forsaken Crossroads on white. And they're gonna scry one. So they're definitely just white, black, and green. If they're playing a crossroads for another white source. I guess they have a mana confluence down, so if they're splashing in a blue or a red, then they have the source for that. And they're gonna anguish on making our Liliana. Which all in all is a pretty good deal for us, since it was kind of a bonus card we drew off a of Spell Thief. And it already killed one of their cards. Let's cultivate to get to these big six mana cards. 
Um, I've already got double for us. Let's go for another blue and black source. Hit for three more damage or put a loot tree in hand. I'll put a loot tree in hand. Man investment out of the way. Put them down to 14. Elish Norn Mother Machines. Our enter the battlefield effects do not trigger anymore. Let's turn her into a treasure token then. Because I don't want to play Gyruda or Invasion of Fiora or Hydroid Crisis. Because this will come in with zero plus one plus one counters. Actually, this isn't technically an enter the battlefield effect. It just enters with the counter. So Crisis would still work. Because the trigger's on us casting it. But Gyruda wouldn't do anything. Invasion of Fiora wouldn't do anything. Yeah, let's, let's frask it up. Two life, hold up Xander's Lounge. Uh, so we can consider or hit them with a 3 3. I don't think. Eh, it's, it's only two more points of damage. We'll hit for four and hold up consider. Rather than hit for six and don't hold up consider. They're down to 9 life with 2 cards in hand. Breach the Multiverse is a pretty big card to have in hand. If anything could save them here, Breach the Multiverse would be it. Invasion of Fiora could be big for us, though. If they pick 2 Legends, if they take their Elish Norn and our Ren and 7 or something. I guess Ren and 7 makes a Tree Folk that's not legendary. Yeah, Breach the Multiverse is a big card here. Anything's gonna flip the game around. This is gonna be it. We'll see. Just wait till they choose their cards and react accordingly. Because there are a million options. We can turn one of the cards into a treasure token if they don't get rid of uh Um Vrasco with whatever enters the battlefield. Yeah, there's way too many options with way too many large text boxes to check. Oh, they have their own Vraska and Vorinclex. So that their Vraska turns one of our creatures into a treasure? And their Vorinclex kills our Vraska? Pretty good. I could Invasion if you're on just Legends then. That's nice. Oh, they're going to draw the card. So we can only hit their Vraska for six, which isn't lethal. Okay. Is this going to get two counters? Thanks to Vorinclex, yeah. They did put themselves down to 7, so if I hit anything that gives plus 1 power, then they're dead. But I don't think I have anything like that in my deck. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. I think I actually want this land, so I can play a land, tap 6 for Invasion of Fiora to kill Vorinclex. Ooh, our battle comes in with half as many counters. It's actually easier to flip too. Uh, and then we hit Vraska to make sure Vraska can't minus two and stay on board. Yeah, I'm going to keep this land. Well, if I lump speakered them more aggressively earlier, we could have just killed them this turn, but it is what it is. I think we're still doing fine. And now I have the mana to Fiora and attack with Loam Speaker. That's so funny. That's so funny that it comes in with two counters, so it's easier to flip. Thanks to uh, their Vorinclex. I could even just flip it here. Give them another target they need to spend a treasure token on. Well, spend a Vraska turning into a treasure on. Yeah, I have a Garuda and Hydra Crisis in hand. We still have a lot of, like, three plus for ones. Let's get a big Menace Death Touch monster and put Vraska down to five so Vraska can just minus two next turn, and that's all. I think this is better than putting them to one. Because if I put them to one, I still only have two creatures. Vraska kills one of them. They just need one removal spell to kill the other. Extinction event on even to kill two of our creatures. Now Vraska kills the other one. That's pretty bad. 
Now an Elvish Mystic, okay, that doesn't matter too much. We've got a Pylon to kill Vraska, beautiful draw. I could even loot tree Pylon and just kill both their cards on board. 13 cards in libraries, Gyruda's not going to mill anybody out. And Gyruda gives us the mana to pile on the Vraska still, so let's go for Gyruda. See what we hit. Nothing. Nothing. Gyruda. You're so rude. It's in the name. Sadness on the stack. We still kill a Vraska. Eight cards left in deck. I'm going to start being a little concerned about hand size, especially because Hydroid Crisis, not hand size, deck size. All right. Ulta and Maverin. Oh boy, that's a big one to put back into your hand and win the game. Could loot tree it for rudeness on the stack, but we'll just hit for exactsies here. And that's going to be it. That is a 7-0 and o run for the return to the Chromatic Cube. Some excellent stuff from our Soul Tide deck. Kind of just feels like a Simic value pile with a bunch of good black removal spells and stuff. Absolutely ridiculous stuff throughout. Uh, I was on a 41-card special without noticing it the whole time too, which is extra sweet. That just adds to the effect. That's incredible. Yeah, super sweet deck. Not much to say that hasn't already been said based on what happened in the gameplay, but we got to play, I think, everything in the deck. It all got to pop off. We had a lot of games. We were making a lot of elementals. Ashiok didn't get to make a bunch of the nightmares and do all the mill stuff, but Ashiok still hit the board, did the effect to bounce an opposing permanent and exile a card from their hand, and uh, that was... Quite nice in one of the games. We got to Gyruda into the Spark Double in one of our games. We got to do the huge Gyruda combo. We also got to win a game with Gyruda as just a 6-mana 6-6 six, six with no text in the final game. So, yeah, Dream Eater helped us as great interaction. Invasion of Fiora was pivotal in several games. Gyruda was massive in a couple games. Sublime Epiphany completely won us a game. Braska was consistent, Slumgar's Command was consistent, Ashiok, Renin 7, Pylon, Hostage Taker, Metamorph, Spark Double, Cultivate, Mythos of Nethroi, Uro, Spell Thief, Loam Speaker, Hydroid Crisis, literally everything in the deck showed up and got to do some really spicy stuff, even stuff that didn't seem like it was going to be that great, got to pop off and do some ridiculous things. So Metamorph was in here just to like spin the wheel with Gyruda again. But Metamorph also copying any non-land permanent, giving us additional board wipes if we have an Invasion of Fiora unflipped on our opponent's board. That was huge in some of those games. The Spell Thief was so much better than I thought it would be because it played incredibly against cheap planes blockers twice in a row. We got to play a Spell Thief to flash it in, put our opponent's Nissa into our hand, and then have creatures on board they didn't expect so that we could just immediately attack Nissa for lethal the, the next turn. And we got to do the same thing against a Liliana. The super sweet thing with a Liliana is that we put a copy of their Liliana into our hand and used her to make them sacrifice their one blocker so that we could clear the path to hit their Liliana. So that was disgusting as well. So Spell Thief is ridiculous against those cheap Planeswalkers. And we had two matchups where it played super well to do that. So everything was super sweet. Lutri was kind of just like the, the cheerleader cheering on from the companion slot, but what is so awesome about Lutri and cube drafts is that you can only draft one of every card anyway, so there is zero cost to running Lutri as your companion. So even though we only cast Lutri like twice in all seven of those games, it was still a little bit of extra value, and just having Lutri cheering us on was some good moral support. So super sweet stuff from everything in the deck. Loved it. Anything that I learned in, in terms of over and under performers, not much. I liked how everything in the deck performed. I would say, in terms of drafting, in the future, I think I would like to take dual lands more highly uh, so I can do even more splashy stuff and have an even more consistent mana base. However, I took dual lands, I think, pretty low in general today, and we just got really lucky in that we were in a draft pod where the the non-basic lands and duels weren't getting drafted that highly, so it didn't pan out poorly for us, but that is one thing that could have went really, really badly, is that I passed up on several duels and then maybe um, 
Maybe we would have ended up with a pretty weak mana base in the end is the worst part, but it all worked out today. Everything's coming up gauntlet. We're going to get the full 7-0 run undefeated, 6,000 gold, and three random historic cards as our rewards. We get a Bishop of Rebirth from Ixalan, Gear Per Guide from M19, and something I already own a playset of from M21. So pretty sweet rewards. I'm always happy to get more gems towards being able to draft again. But that is going to end today's video. As always, I'd like to thank my patrons very much for supporting this channel, as well as you for watching the channel. If you're interested in seeing more videos like this, you can always like, comment, and subscribe to tell the YouTube algorithm to send you some more. We've got Lord of the Rings early access event coming this Thursday, so stay tuned for that really, really soon. Some fresh new draft formats on the horizon. And until then, a little bit more chromatic cube, so all that in the near future if you're interested. Other than that, as always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again soon for some more Magic Arena.